Hello everybody, it's Tim again here, here with my review for Hellraiser 2 Hellbound. I just got finished watching the film, it is extremely fucking late, and I am really tired. So if this review isn't up to snuff, it's not because I didn't enjoy the film, because I did. Uh, I'm just so fucking killed out. Um, I'll just go ahead and say it, it's a three star film out of a possible four. It's not as good as the first movie. Um, it's more... It's more magical than the first movie, I would say. More magical in plot, like with the whole going into hell and stuff. So it makes it slightly more more fun, I think, than the first movie with the whole going into hell and exploring hell and all that. But at the same time, the film isn't as good as the first movie. The first film, the story isn't as tight, and neither are the characters. But just to jump into it, uh, the film picks up the, after the first film. Christy, or Kirsty's boyfriend, I mean, from the first film. Uh, Kirsty's boyfriend is completely wrote out. Uh, they uh, that all they say is they question him about the incident and then send him home, and that's the last we ever last we ever hear of his character, and he never comes back. Instead, we get this new character named Kyle, who works at the hospital. He's like uh, friendly with with Kirsty. You think that he's probably going to end up hooking up with her, and they kind of set it up for that. But he doesn't really amount to anything. He just ends up getting killed by Julia of all <laughs> of all people who comes back in this film uh through a mat through a mattress that uh, her blood is stained on it. And, uh, there's a doctor by the name of Dr. Chenard at this institute. It's like the Chenard Institute. Um and he like uh, he's like obsessed with the brain and the uh, like the the uh like the all the labyrinths of the mind <laughs> I guess you could put it. Um he just he's obsessed with like studying the mind and all that shit and of course he's obsessed with the puzzle box and like he really wants to explore hell and learn more about hell and shit like that um you get a recap of the first movie uh which is really good i i like that i always love it when a film when a sequel re uh picks up you know like with like a recap of the last movie i always enjoy that um jumping into the film here um so Obviously, Kirsty knows that uh, Julia can come back, and uh, Doctor Chenard obviously wants her to come back. So, for, well, for some reason, Jul i mean, for some reason, Kirsty knows that Julia can come back through the bloodstained mattress. How I don't know because she states in the movie that she doesn't know how Frank came back. So, how the fuck does she know that Julia can come back the exact same way? Uh, I have no idea. That's a plot hole. I don't know why. <laughs> Why she thinks that. Also in the film, she thinks her father is in hell. Why would he even be in hell? I don't know. He seemed like a decent guy. I mean, why would he be in hell unless the Cenobites took him there too? But it doesn't really make any sense. And if you know the history of this film, it was they wanted Andrew Robertson back, and they wanted him to be in hell, and they wanted Kirsty to save him in the film. But he said, you got to pay me... <laughs> You have to pay me a decent amount here, and they said fuck you, and then he said fuck you too, and he got the hell out of Dodge. So it was like massive rewrite. They had to change it. Instead of like a uh, uh, Kirsty's dad being in hell, it's actually like fucking Frank, uh, who pretended to be her dad so that she would come there so he could basically fuck her. That's like the, the that's like a really stupid plot element. That's such a weak plot element, and. But I don't hold too. I don't hold it against them too much because they had to write that in really quick. I mean, you basically just think about the entire plot of the movie. It only really happened or really kicked off because Frank is well horny. He's just really horny, and he, he and in and in his own personal hell, he just keeps getting teased and can't never get laid. So it's actually kind of fucking funny. But uh, he pretends to be Kirsty's dad. Somehow he's able to communicate with her and show her like the visions of himself. Like with no skin, he's like pretending to be her father. He like leaving her like a uh, he he writes in blood on the wall. Uh, help me, I'm in hell or whatever. So she thinks it's her dad. I don't know how he's able to project to project these images to her from hell. I mean, you think hell would be a little bit or would be ordered enough or watched over uh, watched over enough, you know, where they'd be like this motherfucker's like passing notes, you know, he's sending messages, but no. <laughs> I don't know why. And for some reason, Kirsty walks up like to the blood on the wall, and, like wipes it with her finger, and, like puts it like on her lips, like that. And I'm like, why the fuck did she do that? Does blood make her horny or something? I don't get that, but whatever. Um, so Doctor Chenard, of course, you get this really fucked up scene that's like really graphic and kind of made me a little bit, you know, ugh, a little bit queasy. Fucking, uh, he's got like this mental patient who's on top of the mattress, and he's like cutting his cell for the fucking straight razor thinking he's got like maggots and stuff on him 
because uh, he like hallucinates bugs and shit on his body. But uh, and he's like cutting the fucking shit out of himself with the razor. And then of course Julia comes up out of the mattress, uh, kills him in a pretty decent scene. The skinless Julia comes up and fucking you know uh, zaps his uh, blood out of the back of his neck. But uh, and so automatically she wants to seduce Doctor Chard to get him to keep helping her, you know, bring more people in so she can, you know, of course, rebuild her skin. And, of course, he's turned on by skinless Julia. Why are people so turned on by skinless people in these films? I don't know. I honestly don't know. But, um, you know, it's like kind of like one, two, skip a few here. You don't really, they don't really, the first film was like all, almost all about, you know, like uh, getting Frank a, a skin and him like killing people to get him a skin. It was really a lot about that. Like, for the most part, that was kind of like the bulk of the story. Or at least the action, anyway. And this, they completely skip over it. And it's just like, you know, bam, boom, Julia's on the last person. And now she's got her skin back. But what's funny is that uh, this this is a plot hole. Her skin comes back perfectly normal. I mean, it's like her regular skin, I mean. And not the skin of the person uh, who she took. So it's her skin. So that's a complete plot hole with compared to the first movie. But I really think the reason why they did that is because uh, they really wanted Julia in this film to be like the, the the like main icon of Hellraiser to like be like a queen of hell type figure or whatever. Uh, this is once again yet before they knew Pinhead was the icon. Um, <laughs> seemed like they they knew the seemed like they knew the Cenobites were the main draw, but they wanted to make her into like the the main you know villain. Um, so they wanted it to be you know that actress and not like her and someone else's skin. They wanted people to like see, you know, her. Uh, but one thing leads to another. Kirsty and Kyle, they want to go obviously to uh, Chenard's house because Kyle was there like spying on Chenard and he saw uh, Julia come up out of the mattress and he knows that, uh, he knows everything kirsty has been saying is true. And chenard has got a bunch of boxes, uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of the puzzle boxes. And we don't know if they actually work or if they're just like replicas. They could just be fakes, just replicas. Like those people that people have made that he wanted to try but can never solve or something. I mean, we never know. It never goes into it. But uh, out of the way, so Kirsty and Kyle, they head there. Kyle is killed by Julia, which really surprised me. I thought he would amount to more than that, but he was pretty fucking useless. But uh, he's killed by Julia, who uh, drains his blood or skin or whatever at the back of his neck. So he's gone. Julia now has a complete set of skin. Kirsty shows up, and, and uh, all Julia does is basically just bitch slap her one time and knocks her, knock her complete out. I find that really funny. The scene's like really funny because uh, Julia's looking at her and she's like, uh, "Kirsty, didn't you know they changed the rules of the fairy tale? I'm no longer the wicked stepmother. I'm not, I'm also the evil queen. So take your best shot, Snow White." And then she, Kirsty comes charging at her, and she just like. <laughs> And it's over. One hit. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> but anyway, kind of makes the hero go down a little bit like a wuss. But either way, so there's this girl named Tiffany who's at the institution. She's, like, terrific at solving puzzles. That's a really, that's a neat idea for a character. Like a character who's, like, obsessed with solving puzzles. And she's mute and doesn't talk. And uh, so Dr. Chenard and Julia, they get her to solve the, solve the puzzle box. She solves it, and, you know, hell opens up. Pinhead and company come out. Um, but, of course, you get a cool line from Pinhead here where he's like, it's not hands that call us, it is desire, <laughs> which I thought was really cool. Once again, added some more of, an, more of an element to, you know, Pinhead and company where it's like, uh, you know, he just doesn't come and take the person who just happens to open the box. They have to have, like, a desire to open the box, you know, like, I guess, uh, kind of like a little evil desire in them to want to know about hell, or at least to uh, want to get the box open, but, um, either way, um, I mean, that's neat, that idea is, but once again, it's something that's not delved up upon, I mean, it's not something that's, I mean, it's not delved into, they give the Cenobites, like, such interesting characteristic, uh, characteristics, uh, had trouble spitting it out, but, uh, they give them such interesting stuff, like, uh, like with the stuff they say and all that, but they don't delve into them enough, uh, deeply enough for me for the films, and when they do, uh, give the Cinebots more screen time, it comes off really silly, like Hellraiser 3, which we'll get to, but, uh, as far as this film goes, 
it's still a really good film and it's highly enjoyable. It's definitely a solid a solid it's a solid film. It could be better. Um well I would say it's a good film. It's not a great film like the first one. This one falls only under the good category. But it's not a bad film by any means. Um it's a three star film, solid three stars. It's a good film. But to jump back into it here. So of course Pinhead knows that it was actually Dr. Chenard who really wants to see everything and wants to know about hell and all that. It's not actually Tiffany because she really doesn't even know what the fuck she was doing. So Dr. Chenard and uh, Julia, they go inside hell and look around and Kirsty goes in there looking for her dad. That's when she finds out it's actually Frank. He fucked her up. Frank has fucked her over and tricked her into coming in there so he can get laid. <laughs> and um, she like sets Frank's picture on fire and he his skin melts off. He turns back into skinless Frank. Julia shows up and like fucking rips his heart out. Once again, like, trying to establish her as, like, the main villain. Just with the scene alone, like, there's fire that shoots up behind her, like, after she rips out Frank's heart. It's really easily trying to establish her as, like, the new, you know, the shit in this franchise, the main villain. But, uh, so she has, like, killed Frank again. Or has she? I mean, Frank's dead and in hell. And even if you don't consider this place hell, it's still, like, some form of a hell. And the people that are in this place are souls and are already dead. So, how can Frank die again, either way? But you don't really, I mean, she rips his heart out and he, like, falls over. So, maybe he's just in a colossal amount of pain. Maybe he's not truly dead. Maybe you can damage their bodies as much as possible, but their spirit, like, still lives on. You can just, like, reconfigure them, you know, put their body back together or whatever. Probably something like that. But either way, that was just, you know, a tiny little head scratcher. Um... <clears throat> Dr. Chenard is there. You find, uh, Of course, you find out that Julia was actually allowed to come back. And you get to see, like, what the, the, the version of the devil, I guess, or the god of hell looks like in uh, Hellraiser. And it's like this big fucking float in a Rubik's Cube. Well, that's actually, like, kind of like the shell of it, I think. And inside of it, we really don't know what it actually looks like. We just see, like, the tentacles and stuff of it every now and then. Uh, like, one of the tentacles connects to, to Dr. Dr. Chenard's head when he gets turned into a Cenobite because Julia, like, has brought... Uh, Leviathan, Dr. Chenard has brought a, she's like, going to bring, you know, Leviathan souls, that's the name of like the god of hell, and the Hellraiser Leviathan, I guess, um, and the sound Leviathan makes, uh, like you hear a, bit, uh, a really loud sound uh, in the film when they're in hell, and it's actually Morse code for God, I believe, which is kind of cool, um, that's a neat idea, but, um, so he, uh, she's like brought the Leviathan, a soul, and she's brought him, well, Dr. Trenard, and Dr. Trenard, of course, gets turned into a Cenobite, and you get to see a Cenobite chamber, an actual chamber, which is really cool. Before I forget, at the beginning of the film, you get to see how Pinhead gets turned into Pinhead, and it's really cool seeing Doug Bradley without the makeup, and then, like, seeing him getting cuts all over his head, and this big giant fucking hammer, like, nailing the nails into his head. That was really cool, I really enjoyed that. And, uh, even, uh, even though we see like Pinhead, what he actually does look like without the makeup, seeing Doug Bradley, seeing Doug Bradley's face, the makeup on Pinhead is so good and like so he's so epic looking that it's still hard for me to see Doug Bradley underneath all that makeup. It is because uh, he looks like you know so different. But uh, either way, so Doctor Chenard he gets turned into a Cenobite, but since he wanted to come to hell voluntarily, unlike the other Cenobites, he still seems to still have his memories. Of when he was human. It's kind of like. It, I guess it's different. Because he wanted to become a Cenobite. Well not so much become a Cenobite. But he wanted to know more about hell. And actually learn about it. So it's like he's a volunteer soldier. Like he's you know always been on Leviathan's side I guess. So Leviathan like hooks this big like dick looking tentacle thing. To the top of his fucking head. That gives him abilities that the other Cenobites don't have. He can like shoot shit out of his hands. Like uh. Like, it gives him extra power that the other Cenobites don't have. It makes him, like, his... It makes him, like, uh, its prime enforcer, I guess. Gives him more power than the others. Um, and then you get this really fucking shitty special effects scene where, like, this uh, current is, like, blowing behind Julia and she's, like, trying to grab a hold of Kirsty and Tiffany. And, like, she fucking, like, her skin splits open in the back and, like, her body comes flying out of it. And it, uh, you see it flying down like a tunnel and it's like a little fucking obvious like little doll flying down through there. And it looks so fucking shitty. Uh, why does the Hellraiser movies have like really good effects and then towards the ends of the films they have like little weak effects? 
I don't know why. The effects, the weak effects at the end of the first film still had charm. I mean, they had like that old school, low budget charm to them that made them enjoyable for me, despite the fact that they were weak. I don't really harp on the weaker effects at the end of the first movie too much. It's just the little lights and shit, like when the Cenobites disappear at the end of the first film. Like these little blue lights and orange lights and shit, like when they get zapped back in the hell when Kirstie's like putting the box in reverse or whatever, or solving it again or whatever. Um, but that effect with the doll or whatever was just fucking shitty. But, um, other than that, so, you got Dr. Chenard, who's a Cenobite now. He's, like, whopping everybody out at the fucking hospital. Uh, you got a scene in the film, uh, that's not in some other versions. I watched this film on DVD, and it's got a scene where Kirsty first goes into hell, and she's, like, in her own little hell for a minute, where she, like, sees a photo of her mom, and then, like, the photo, like, transforms into Julia, I think, or there's another photo there that's, like, a photo of Julia. Um, and it starts like bleeding and bugs and shit start showing up. The scene is kind of useless. It's not in my VHS copy of the film or not on it, I mean, but it's in the DVD version that I watched. So I'm like, why was that took out of some versions? I don't know, but what the fuck ever. But, um, so you get the Cenobites. Of course, Kirsty has got like a picture of Pinhead, whose real name is Elliot Spencer, where he was like in the army or whatever, I believe. And, we don't get too much background on him, but we basically get to know that he was in the army and we get to see what he looked like, which is still really cool. Seeing more Doug Bradley is always a plus, unless they overdo him like they do in Hellraiser 3, but <laughs> that's another story. But, um, so she reminds the Cenobites that they used to be human, so they decide, you know, fuck this shit, fuck working for hell anymore. We want to, you know, help Kirsty and try to protect her because the Chenard Cenobite shows up and. He's like, I'm taking over this operation. <laughs> He's wanting to be the big dick of the house now. And you get uh, a really weak fight here with the Cenobites versus Chenard. But he has more powers than they do because he's like getting powers from straight from Leviathan. But it's just like they just shoot him with chains, Pinhead does, and then he like cuts the chains. And so he, he's basically broke through the chains, he's cut them. And so it's like, the Cenobites are like, oh, well, he beat our only weapon, the chains, you know, there's nothing else we can do. So they just, like, give up. And I'm like, what? <laughs> that's, that's weak. They could have done better than that. That was, that's so weak. But uh, he starts systematically killing them off one by one. He kills the female Cenobite. She gets, like, stabbed in the neck. And then you see, you see each, every, when each Cenobite dies, you see their human form after. And the female Cenobite, <laughs> let's put it this way, she ain't ugly. Uh, human form wise, but other, but anyway, and then the chatter Cenobite is actually like a little kid. I thought that was kind kind of neat, actually, kind of creative to actually make him a little kid. But it makes you wonder like how fucking much that they have to mutilate him to make him look like the fucking chatter Cenobite. Which in this film he has eyes for some reason. In the last film he didn't. I think they actually gave the chatter Cenobite eyes in this film just for the sole fact because the actor complained that he couldn't fucking see in the outfit, so they gave him eyes just because of that, <laughs> which is really funny. Um, but uh, that's a little another little nitpick. Um, and then the last one to go, of course, is Pinhead. Chenard kills Pinhead, but I do I do like the death of Pinhead. That Chenard actually has to turn Pinhead back into a human, take away his uh, take away his powers. That way he'll be easier to kill, uh, which is pretty neat. But Pinhead kind of just stands there while he does it. I would expect him to fight back a little bit more. It's almost as if he just, you know, wants to die. But uh, you know, you would expect him to fight back a little bit more. But he doesn't really seem like he gives a shit. So he gets turned back into human, and then he like cuts Pinhead's throat, or Elliot's throat now, and then so he's dead. Um. It was still kind of a cool death and pretty epic, you know, of him, like, turning Pinhead back into human uh, before he slit his throat. But still, I would like to, you know, all the Cenobites together as a group to fight, put up a little bit more of a fight. You'd think, you know, there being four of them, even if he is hooked straight into Leviathan with more powers than they have, that they'd be able to do something. It's like they can only use the chains and, like, they suck at hand-to-hand -hand combat is basically what it seems like. But they carry around knives and stuff all the time, so you'd expect them to like you know try to stab the fuck out of him or something. But either way, it's still it's still an okay little fight. It with the the death of Pinhead with him getting turned back into a human before he dies is what makes it uh okay an okay little little dukem. <laughs> 
But, uh, so I like, I don't mind the death of Pinhead with him actually getting turned back into human first. That's kind of epic, and I like that. I just wish that the Cenobites as a group would have put up a little bit more of a fight. But, um, and so then you got, of course, Chenard still coming after him. Tiffany's, like, solving the puzzle blocks. And you get a funny scene where Tiffany's not talked through the, she hasn't talked through the whole movie, and her first word is when she sees the Chenard Cenobite, and she goes, shit. I thought that was funny as fuck. I love that. I laugh my ass off of that. That's one humorous line in Hellraiser that works. Hellraiser tries to play it so serious, and sometimes the humor feels a little bit forced in, but that line worked. But Chenard sent about himself is fine, but he keeps making, like, doctor puns and stuff all the time, and they get a little bit annoying after a while. But, um, so Tiffany's, like, solving the box, and she's got it, like, on it. Well, when they're in hell, the fucking puzzle box turns into, like, a diamond shape, which is, like, another form of Leviathan. And so she has to make it back into the cube shape. And so, like, uh, she has to go back into hell. Her and, uh, her and Kirsty go back into hell where the fucking uh, diamond version of the box is still laying. And so they get in there, and she picks it up, and she's solving it back into the cube. And then fucking Chenard shows up. And uh, then Kirsty distracts him by actually fucking wearing Julia's skin. Uh, which is why I say that Chenard still has his memories because he recognizes Julia and knows who she is and actually is still in love with her despite everything. And it's like he didn't want to be a Cenobite at first because he seemed like he was in a lot of pain when he was in the fucking Cenobite chamber, but now he's like perfectly okay with being a Cenobite. I find that funny. I guess he just got used to it or enjoys being one or enjoys the power. But, um, so he's just, uh, he's like making out with Julia, but it's actually Kirstie wearing the fucking Julia skin, which is like pretty epic, and I actually thought that was kind of cool that she would actually fucking wear another person's skin, uh, to, to save her friend. That was, that was cool, I like that. And so, uh, Leviathan's like shifting forms and turning from the diamond back into the cube, and then, uh, Chenard sees Tiffany, tries to stab her with his tentacles, and they, they got little blades on the end of them, and they get stuck. Uh, in in this fucking like boardwalk, or I guess it's a part of the or a part of hell, or one of the maze parts of hell, or the or uh, Leviathan or something. They get stuck in it, and fucking while Leviathan shifts and forms, it causes like the big dick tentacle attached to uh, Chenard's head to like be ripped off, and it like takes his whole fucking head with it, and he fucking loses his head. But they don't like focus in really in the movie on the fact that Leviathan shifting. But I know that's why he ends up getting decapitated. It's because it's like changing forms. But they don't really explain it well or show it that well in the film. So it's kind of making you think, you know, why the fuck did his head just get ripped off? Because it happens like really quick. But whatever, it's still a cool death. I mean, I like seeing him get decapitated. That's just, it's like uh, the fucking big dick on his head ripped his head off. So it's like, you know, dickhead lost his head. But either way, it's still a decent death. So he's dead. So Tiffany and uh, Kirsty have to get the fuck out of there. They manage to get the fuck out of there. And then one last thing at the end of the film that weakens it a little bit for me once again is the effects. The fucking light effects at the end of this film are look even weaker to me than the light effects at the end of the last film. The ones at the end of the last film still had charm to me. Uh, maybe it's because the last film was a better film. The first one was. Um, but at the end of this film, it's like there's these fucking blue lights escaping, like flying out of hell. And they're supposed to be like souls escaping because Leviathan's like losing a little bit of power or whatever. Or, or losing its hold over the souls because it's changing shape back into the cube. And they're like flying out of there. And the light effects just look really bad. Um, and then you get like this fucking beam of light that like when the, the wall, like the gate to hell is like closing together. And you get like this really weird looking uh, weak light effect, blue light effect. And it looks really dated badly. Um, but other than that, the movie is still really, still a really good film, and definitely the second best in the series, and in my opinion, this is where the Pinhead character, uh, has been pretty much, uh, reached his peak, uh, the, I mean, you could always do more with a character if you're a talented enough writer, but after seeing all the other films, this is where the character really reaches his peak, and there really wasn't any reason to bring him back in the third one, besides the fact that they learned, you know, after this one, that Pinhead's the most popular character, and they were like, you know, oh, fuck, what are we gonna do? We gotta bring him back somehow, which, um, the way they brought him back still decently creative in part three, despite the fact that three is a much weaker film than this one, but I still thought the way they brought him back in three is still, still decent, but, um, at the end of this film, you get like this fucking like a uh, pillar of souls that comes up out of this bed. 
uh, out of the mattress that Julia came up out of, and it's like uh, got that fucking hobo on it from the last movie. And he looks directly at the camera and says, "Watch your pleasure, sir." And that's how the film ends. I like that ending. I like that, and the Pillar of Souls thing coming up out of the mattress kind of makes you wonder, like, you know, what the fuck is going on? What's going to happen in part three? <laughs> but we'll get to that one soon enough. But um, all in all, this is a really good film. What really uh, amps uh, the first half of the film? I would say up until they get into hell. It's kind of just, you know, decent, just okay. But once they get into hell, it really amps it up, makes the film a lot more fun with all the crazy shit that's going on in hell. Like, where Tiffany stumbles into, like, her own hell for a brief second while she's in hell. And it's like, this fucking baby is, like, so in its own mouth, and there's, like, this fucking freaky-ass-looking clown, <laughs> like, laughing or something like that directly in front of the camera. Uh, that's some fucked up shit, and that's really entertaining to me. That stuff... If you could have made the whole movie take place in hell and got to hell quicker in this film, this film, I w uh, this film would be better in my opinion. Um, and also, if you could just fucking do something about the weak light effects at the end of this film, uh, once again, this film would also be better. But as it stands, it's still a really good film. It's easily the second best film in the franchise. When I say three stars, I mean a solid three stars. It's a really good film, hands down. For part three, honestly, I would have liked to have seen Tiffany's character come back. Uh, another one of the things, once again, that weakens it really uh, a lot is the fact that Andrew Robinson's character should have came back. The script obviously wanted him to come back in the film, and you, and the the fact in where it was rewritten or, or rewrote, it comes off a little weak. It's like you, it's like his character should be there, but he's not. So the it's kind of like the script is muddled and it comes off a weaker as a weaker finished product than the first film because of his absence. But other than those things, uh, the film still, with the visuals and all that, and with Doug Bradley and the Cenobites, the original group of Cenobites from the first two films back, the best ones, um, they get the Cenobites get shittier and shittier with the other films, the designs, and the characters themselves get shittier and shittier with the other films. But this core group from the first two is fucking awesome and I love them. And would love to have a set of action figures of them. But all in all, this is a three-star film of a possible four. I really recommend this to people uh, who, who, if you love, if you watched the first Hellraiser and loved it like I did, I definitely recommend that you definitely check out at least this sequel. It is definitely worth your time and definitely one hell of a good watch. <laughs> um, all in all, yes, this is a good sequel. Not a great sequel like the first film, but a good sequel. Uh, definitely a better than average sequel, and definitely one that people should uh, should watch. It's better than Nightmare on Elm Street 2. It's better than, uh, I would say it's better than Friday the 13th Part 2. I would also say that it, well, well I, I wouldn't, I don't really know if it's better than Friday the 13th Part 2. I don't really remember much about Friday the 13th Part 2. It's been a long time since I've watched it. I did a, well I don't remember enough about it. It's been a, a while back since I watched that film to do a review for it. But uh, I would definitely say it's better than, uh, I would say it's better than Child's Play 2 as well. And it's better than Nightmare on Elm Street 2. But I don't remember, I don't remember enough about Friday the 13th Part 2 to remember if it's better or worse than that film. But it is better than Child's Play 2. And it's also better than Nightmare on Elm Street 2. And so all in all, yeah, it's a good movie and a good sequel. It just could have been, the script needed to be a little bit tighter. And Andrew Robinson needed to come back. But all in all, it's a it, it is it is a good movie, and I highly recommend it to fans of the Hellraiser franchise and fans of horror films. So I'll see you guys again with my review for Hellraiser three, and until then, um, I will tear your soul apart. <laughs>